Welcome to Steps to Life. Ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? I want to talk to you today about the church that is either dead or almost dead. Now, if you are a child, perhaps you have never seen anybody die. If you have never worked in a hospital, uh, perhaps you have never been around somebody who was going through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, all the time I was a child, my parents uh, worked in medical institutions. Uh, my mother was uh, the head of, nur of the nurses in more than one hospital. She was the chief nurse on the staff of more than one different hospital where we lived. My father was either a business manager or a credit manager of these same hospitals. <clears throat> and <clears throat> So my, my mother saw death all the time. You see death all the time when you're working in a hospital. I had never seen anybody die until I was about oh, 14 or 15 years of age. My, by that time, my, my father had quit working at a hospital, and he had started to manage uh, one, a large nursing home for the elderly. We, had, we didn't have so many uh, rehabilitation patients in those days. Uh, we had nobody had ever heard of AIDS in those days and uh, nobody had ever heard of Alzheimer's in those days. And so, uh, but we had a lot of, we, we didn't have those kind of people, but we had a lot of elderly people in this nursing home. And <clears throat> we lived right across the street. Our house was right across the street from this nursing home where we lived. And <clears throat> one night, 
we I got a call, my father and I went over to the nursing home, a, a gentleman who was probably 85 years of age had had a heart attack. <clears throat> now, we didn't have the kind of facilities back in those days uh, that we have today. Uh, and uh, they called the physician, the nurses called the physician, and I was with this gentleman, and <clears throat> it was the first time in my life that I'd ever seen somebody die. <clears throat> And the physician came. They didn't have the, all the kind of technology then that we had now, but he did have a case with drugs in it. And he, he gave this man a shot right in the chest. He gave him a shot of epinephrine to try to get his heart going again, but it didn't work. He couldn't get his heart going again. <laughs> and I stood, that was the first, one of the first nights of my life that I ever stayed awake until 1.30 in the morning. And even at 1.30 in the morning, I didn't feel like going to sleep because I had just watched a person die. And when you're in a situation like that, you, what comes to your mind, you think, if I could just, if I just had some way to, to get this person back alive. I didn't have any way to get him back alive. Is there a way to get a person or a church that is just about dead back to life again? Is there a way? There is a way. And that's what our scripture lesson was about this morning. We're going to read it again in just a moment. Before we read it, let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand what we read. Father in heaven, we thank you that when we were ruined, when we are about to die, that there is a way out, that there is somebody that can bring us back to life. And we earnestly pray that you will help us to understand what you're trying to teach us about the way to eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, I invite you to open it again to Revelation 3, and we will read verses 1 to 6. This is about the church that is either dead or just about dead. Both situations in this church. Revelation 3, verses 1 to 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis. All these seven churches were in cities in the western part of what we call Turkey today. All these seven churches were in cities that were in the western part of the nation that we call Turkey. Sardis was one of those cities. If you go, if you look at the map, and when you started and got off of a ship at Ephesus and you took the Roman road, you would, and you got on the Roman road at Ephesus, the next city that you would come to would be a city called Smyrna. And then if you stayed on the road, the next city that you would come to would be a city called Pergamos. And then if you stayed on the Roman road and went farther, you would then come to a city that was called Thyatira. That's the fourth one. Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira. And the fifth city that you would come to on the Roman road was this city, Sardis. If you stayed on the road, of course, there were two more cities in the same order given here. Sardis is the fifth city that you would come to on the Roman road as you travel from Ephesus. And uh, there were Christian churches in all of these cities. And this letter describes their spiritual condition. But how God can take things that are so simple and make them so comprehensive, I've never understood in my life. But this is one of the marvels of the Bible. God took the spiritual condition of these seven churches in these seven cities and made it an example, a type of the spiritual condition of the Christian church throughout the world during the seven periods of Christian history from the first coming of Christ until the second coming of Christ. Very fascinating to study. However, 
the experience of any individual church could be the experience of any one of these seven churches. There are two churches that we especially want to become like. That is the church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a wonderful word. It means brotherly love. We have a city in the United States by that name. It comes from this, comes from this passage of scripture, Philadelphia. It means brotherly love, the love of the brother. We, in our church today, we want to become like the church of Smyrna and we want to become like the church of Philadelphia. Now, there are some churches you don't want to be like. Two of the churches that you don't want to be like are the church at Sardis and the church at Laodicea. Those are two churches that you don't want to be like. Interestingly, you're all aware, if you have access to the Ellen White writings, that there are two churches, well, no, I'm sorry, there are three churches that Ellen White points out over and over again exemplify the experience of the Seventh-day Adventist church that we're going through today. Those three churches are the church at Ephesus, the church at Sardis, and the church at Laodicea. We cannot study all, all of those things this morning. We're just going to look at one, the church at Sardis. And this is a church that's either dead or just about dead. And let's read it. These say, things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive, but you're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you will not know the hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes, the same will be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the church that's dead. Isn't that what we read? This is a church that's dead, and in it, there's a lot of people that are almost dead. They're not quite dead, but they're almost dead. Some of the people are dead, and some of the people are just almost dead. There's a few. There's just a few that are overcoming. Jesus gives a special message to them in verse 5. And remember how important this is. The Bible, friends, I want to say this is kind. If there's anyone here, that, and you have been taught by your spiritual teachers that once you're saved, you're always saved. Let me just say to you as kindly as I know how that the, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that once you're saved, you're saved and, and, no, and you can never go out and be lost. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches that a person that is saved can turn his back on the Lord and be lost. And a person that is lost can turn his back on the devil and be saved. Notice verse 5, before we get started. This is the verse that 
I don't want to be overbearing on anybody, but it surely wouldn't hurt anybody to memorize this verse. I memorized it when I was probably 10 or 12 years old. Revelation 3, 5. It is a powerful verse. This verse tells us that if I overcome, that's I conquer, my name, Jesus will not blot out my name out of the book of life. Is that important that my name not be blotted out of the book of life? Well, yes, it is. Look in your Bible in Revelation 20, 15. What does it tell you in Revelation 20, 15? If your name is not in the book of life, what is going to happen to you someday? What does it tell you in Revelation 20, 15? You're going to be cast in the lake of fire. If you are not going to be cast into the lake of fire someday, now please, I'm not, hell, I'm not a hell and damnation preacher. You know that. I don't spend a lot of time talking about hell like some preachers do. I'm, I knew a I think it was a Baptist preacher. He was talking to a whole bunch of Christian workers one time, and he was saying how he just preached a sermon for 55 minutes on hell. I thought, dear, oh, dear. And it, so I'm not that kind of a preacher. And you know that, that I don't spend a lot of time here dwell, talking and dwelling about hell. But there's, there's nothing the matter for a minute or two thinking about it, that if you don't want to be cast into the lake of fire someday, your name has to be where? It has to be in the book of life, Revelation 20, 15. And if your name is in the book of life, it is very important that it stay there and not get erased. Is it possible for your name to be blotted out of the book of life? Now read the text, Revelation 3, 5. Is it possible for your name to be blotted out of the book? Yes, it is. If you don't want your name to be blotted out of the book, what does it say that you and I are to do? We're to overcome. We live in a questioning generation. So as soon as you read something like that, there's always some skeptic that hasn't read his Bible very much that says, well, what am I supposed to overcome? Well, just in case there's somebody that thinks like that, let's read, just read two or three texts. What are you supposed to overcome? Well, let's just read it from the Bible. I won't tell you. Let the Bible tell you. Uh, look in 1 John, the fifth chapter, verse 4. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes what? The world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. If you're born of God, you will overcome the world. And it says in verse 18, We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. If you're born of God, you overcome the world, you don't sin. 1 John 5, 4, and verse 18. Now, like I said, we're living in a skeptical, questioning generation. Somebody says, oh, preacher, what do you mean when, what does the Bible mean when it says you overcome the world? Well, we'll, we'll let the Bible answer that one too. Uh, look in 1 John 2. Here's what the world is. Verses 15 to 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I remember one time when I was 19 years old and I was down in the city of Chattanooga. And I was in a service station and I was looking, actually they were working on the bus as I remember. And I was standing there, it was, it was cold, so I was, standing, I was in there to be in, out of the weather. And I don't know why, I don't understand why or how God chooses a time to speak to you, uh, to your mind. I was standing there and all of a sudden it just hit me. I love the world. The Bible says, don't love the world. I don't know, I don't know why it hit me then. I, don't, I was standing in a service station and they were servicing the bus. I don't know why it hit me then, but it, I realized I love the world, but I must not love the world. I must lose, I must cast the love of the world out of my heart. Now, what is in the world that we love? Look what it is. It's verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world, and the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Everything that is in the world is the lust of, the word lust, by the way, it simply means, that's a Greek word, epithumia, and it simply means that you have a very strong desire to do something. You have a very strong desire to do something because of 
if you're 15 years old, because of some hormones that have been released into your bloodstream. You have very strong desires that you didn't have when you were five years old, 10 years ago. The lust, the very strong desires of the flesh and of the eyes. The strong craving that you have with your eyes and the ostentatiousness or the pride of life. That, that's all there is in the world. And if that's all you have... I have here my... I've shown you this before. This is my father's Bible that my father had uh, in World War II. I want to read to you. This is, this is just a special little... This is just an extra, a little nugget, especially for the young people. This is uh, my father, uh, I, I like this so well, I wrote it over with a pen because the pencil was wearing out. I wrote it over what my father wrote in his Bible. He says, this is especially for the young people, think about this one. You better have nothing to live on. You're better to have nothing to live on and something to live for than something to live on and nothing to live for. If the world's got a hold of you, that's something to think about. It's better to have nothing to live on and something to live for than to have something to live on and nothing to live for. What's in the world? Oh, it's the strong craving of the flesh, the strong craving of the eyes and the pride of life. And, and if you get that, then that's all you have, then it's going to pass away. There are two other things that the Christian is to overcome. Since we started talking about what it is you overcome, we better just touch on those really, really quick. One is in James 4, verse 7. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You're to overcome the world and the devil and... In James 1, James 1, verses 13 to 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. That's the sinful nature, or what the, Paul calls usually the flesh. So what is the Christian supposed to overcome? The flesh, the world, and the devil. If you overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil, then Jesus says, I won't blot your name out of the book of life. The problem is, in the church at Sardis, according to verse 5, there was only a few, well, first four, excuse me. There were only a few people that were having that experience. There's four, four and five. Only a few. The most of the people in the church were either dead or almost dead. Now, is there any point in any preacher preaching to a church that's dead? Well, yes, there is. Because when the Word of God is spoken, dead people can come back to life. Let's just read that in the Bible. Uh, look in, we could read it from the, Ezekiel's vision about the valley of the di, uh, dry bones, but uh, instead of that, we'll read it from the New Testament in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. It says, starting in verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But, of, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatever does make manifest is light. 
Wherefore he says, Awake, you that sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. When God speaks, the dry bones, the dead come to life. I love to dwell upon this because Jesus is coming soon, friends. And when Jesus comes, he's going to speak. He will be way up in the sky. I don't know how high. That's up to him to decide how high. He'll be way up in the sky and he will look down and he will speak. Just one sentence. He's already told us the sentence he's going to speak. Do you know what he's going to, when he's up in the sky, do you know what he's going to say? He's going to look down to this earth and he's going to say, Awake, 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 you that sleep in the dust and arise. And there will be an earthquake bigger than any earthquake that's ever been in this world. And the tombs of the righteous will open up all over the world. And millions, we don't know how many millions, probably billions, but I don't know. We don't know. Millions and millions of people that have died in Christ will come to life. I've imagined, tried to imagine it in my mind many times. What will that be like? I've always thought that if I die before the Lord comes, I'm not in the first resurrection, one of the first questions I want to know is, what is the date? Now, you can decide what you would ask. What is the date? But friend, if you should die and you're going to be in the resurrection that happens when Jesus comes, you must not die spiritually before it ever happens. You know, the Bible talks about people... Maybe I should look up the text. I didn't look up the text, but I, maybe we should read this. The Bible talks about people that are dead while you think they're still alive. Let's look at it. Look in 1 Timothy 5, verses 5 and 6. It says, Now she that is a widow, that her husband's died, Indeed, and desolate, trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. So here's a person, you think when you look at them that they're alive, but they're not really alive. Spiritually, they're what? They're dead. Now that's the problem with the church in Sardis. There's people that... If you look at them, you look, they, it looks like they're alive. They're alive physically, and they come to church. And they listen to whoever's preaching that day preach a sermon, but they're dead. They don't understand the spiritual meaning of even what's spoken because they're dead. And, you know, when a person dies, I've thought this through many, many times, When a person comes to life, they're born. They come to life because of vital energy, vital force that they have inherited from their father and their mother. So we, we, we don't understand it. We sometimes call it the spark of life. When a person dies... that vital force, that spark of life leaves. Oftentimes, at, right at the moment that a person dies, there's a little quivering that goes, takes place throughout their body, that, and it's gone. And you can read in the Desire of Ages, when Jesus brought people back to life and he spoke to them, and the White talks about it, all of a sudden there was a little quivering in their body, and that, that spark of life came back in, and they, they lived again. And my friend... If you're spiritually dead, God would like to speak to you and bring you back to life again. And it says here in this passage of Scripture in Revelation 3, Revelation 3, these people, they have a name that they're alive, but they're dead. 
And most of them are dead, but then there's a, some that just aren't quite dead yet. It says in verse 2, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. If you're dead spiritually, the Lord would like to speak to you, cause that quivering to take place in your spirit again, bring you back to life, put that life back in. See, there's a, there's a vital force, a vital, vital element there that if you have it, you're alive, and if you don't have it, you're dead. It's just as true of your spiritual life as it is of your physical life. And by the way, it doesn't take any more of a miracle for God to raise a physically dead person than it does for God to raise a spiritually dead person. It seems this takes the same type of vital force, but God can do both. But if you're going to be saved when Jesus comes, you can't be spiritually dead and yet go to heaven. That, that can't be. You have to be brought to life. You have, that's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you're born again, what's the born again? That's, the Holy Spirit's going to put new life in you. Now these people, we're running out of time, these people in the church of Sardis, if you've studied about them, Ellen White says that some of them were people that had listened to John the Baptist. And what had happened, let me just be brief, what had happened so that these people that used to be spiritually alive had lost what they had and had died spiritually? What happened? I have a number of notes before me on how this process takes place. I want to read one or two. One of them from the book, This Day with God, page 211. It tells us how Christians lose, she calls it, the vital power. Now remember, physically, you have vital power that you inherited from your father and mother. And as long as you have that in you, you are physically alive. And if at any time you lose that, you will be dead. In the same way, when a person is born again, the Holy Spirit recreates a new spirit, a new mind, New spiritual life is created because until a person is converted, the Bible says that you're dead in trespasses and sins. You can read that in Ephesians. And until you're born again, you're dead in trespasses and sins. And these people had been born again, but after they'd been born again, they died again. Spiritually, they died. How did that happen? How does it happen today? Listen carefully. I'll read this paragraph and you'll, you'll understand one of the main ways that it happens. I'll just read half the paragraph. If those who profess to be followers of Christ neglect to shine as lights in the world, the vital power will leave them. If the vital power leaves, what happens? You're dead. Physically, if the vital power that you inherited from your father and mother, if that leaves you, you are dead. Spiritually, if the vital power that the Holy Spirit put into your heart and mind when you are born again, if that leaves, you're dead. And let me read that sentence again. I'll read it clear to the end this time. If those who profess to be followers of Christ neglect to shine as lights in the world, the vital power will leave them and they will become cold. That's what happens, by the way, when a person dies. If you ever work in a hospital. If you're there 30 or minutes or more after they die, they're cold. Which will make them bodies of death instead of living representatives of Jesus. What happens when a person is spiritually dead? Well, she said the spell of indifference. What's the spell of indifference? Well, the spell of indifference is what you see all over the Christian churches today, including many Adventist churches. You can preach, you can do anything you want to do, and people just sit there 
and it just it doesn't affect them. Ellen White says it's like a door that just goes back and forth on the hinges. It just doesn't affect them. Of course, that's the way a dead person is. A dead person, did you hear the story about a man that was so angry with somebody that died that when they had the funeral and this person was lying in the, cof, in the coffin at the front of the church, this person was so angry they came up and they just cursed this dead person. And you know what? Dead person didn't do anything. Dead person's indifferent. Bodies of death instead of living representatives of Jesus. What was it? What, how did they lose it? How did they lose it? They did not shine as lights in the world. In other words, you remember Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. These people weren't doing that. At the Steps to Life, we, uh, we're reading through the testimonies of the church. Actually, we're reading through the testimonies of the church for the second time. We have read all nine volumes of the testimonies of the church in our worships for the last, during the last several years. We've read them all, and we're reading them a second time. We're, we're in volume four. And... <clears throat> A few days ago, in our staff worship, we read a testimony that I personally have read through many, many times. I used to remind the students at Southwestern Adventist College about this testimony. But it made such an impression on my mind, I thought, every Adventist needs to study this. And I want to read part of this testimony to you so that you'll see the connection between what we're talking about and the judgment and the end of the world. Remember, if you don't want to lose the vital power, what do you have to do? You have to shine as lights in the world. You have to be doing something in God's work. If you're not doing anything in God's work, what will happen? You'll die. Let me read just a little bit. We read this in worship the other day. I'll read sentences from 384 to 386. It says, the great day of the execution of God's judgment seemed to have come. 10,000 times 10,000 were assembled before a large throne upon which was seated, was seated a person of majestic appearance. Several books were before him, and upon the covers of each was written in letters of gold, which seemed like a burning flame of fire, ledger of heaven. One of these books, containing the names of those who claimed to believe the truth, was then opened. Immediately I lost sight of the countless millions about the throne, and only those who were professedly children of the light and of the truth engaged my attention. Another book was opened, wherein were recorded the sins of those who professed the truth. Under the general heading of selfishness came every other sin. There were also headings over every column, and underneath these opposite each name were recorded in their respective columns the lesser sins, under covetousness came falsehood, theft, robbery, fraud, and avarice. Under ambition came pride and extravagance. Jealousy stood at the head of malice, envy, and hatred. And intemperance headed a long list of fearful crimes, such as lasciviousness, adultery, indulgence of animal passions, etc. As I beheld, I was filled with inexpressible anguish and exclaimed, Who can be saved? Who will stand justified before a God whose robes are spotless, who are faultless in the sight of a pure and holy God? And then it says, skipping down, one class were registered as cumberers of the ground. As the piercing eye of the judge rested upon these, their sin of neglect were sins of neglect were distinctly revealed, or with pale, quivering lips, they acknowledged that they had been traitors to their holy trust. They had had warnings and privileges, but they had not heeded nor improved them. They could now see that they had presumed too much upon the mercy of God. True, they had not such confessions to make as had the vile and basely corrupt, but like the fig tree, they were cursed because they bore no fruit. They had not put to use the talents entrusted to them. 
It says, this class had made self-supreme, laboring only for selfish interests. Although professing to be servants of, of Christ, they brought no souls to Him. Had the cause of God been dependent on their efforts, it would have languished, for they not only withheld the means lent them of God, but they withheld themselves. The names of all who professed the truth were mentioned. Some were reproved for their unbelief, others for having been slothful servants. They had allowed others to do the work in the master's vineyard and to bear the heaviest responsibilities while they were selfishly serving their own temporal interests. Had they cultivated the abilities God had given them, they could have been reliable burden bearers working for the interest of the master. Said the judge, all will be justified by their faith and judged by their work. You know, there's a saying among preachers. I learned this when I was, I think I was still in college studying theology. And it's been true, I don't know, you can ask our workers here who have visited foreign countries, whether it's true in foreign countries or not. I don't know if the numbers are right or not, but you get the idea from the, from the expression. And the expression is, in whatever church you pastor or work, you will find that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Now, please don't anybody think that I'm getting after you. I'm not getting after anybody. I'm just concerned about your soul. <laughs> if you are not involved in God's work in an active way, now it's not for me to say to you what specifically you are to work in in the Lord's vineyard. That's not for me. That's up to the Lord to direct you. But if you're not actively involved in God's service... Now, by the way, friends, we all have temporal interests. Probably every family here, probably every family here has at least one car to maintain and service and keep running and so forth. And probably every, per, every family here has a house or a mobile home or some living quarters that has to be maintained and kept up and either paid rent or made payments or, or sustained... And everybody here that has a family, if you're the wife or the mother, you know that most people like to eat three times a day, and so you have to, ha you have to make a provision to have food and to have it prepared, and people need to have clean clothes to wear, and uh, people need to have a bed to sleep in at night. Most people don't like to sleep on the ground. So we all have these temporal interests that we have to take care of. I have it, you have it, we all have it. And if we spend all of our time with our temporal interests, we can take care of ourselves better than if we just spend part of our time with our temporal interests. And so that's a temptation. And notice here what the problem was with these people. It says, the names of all who profess the truth were mentioned. They had allowed, some of these, had allowed others to do the work in the master's vineyard to, to bear the heaviest responsibilities while they were selfishly serving their own temporal interests. Oh, friend, if your whole life is involved in serving your temporal interests, you're going to die spiritually. You'll lose that vital force, that vital spark of spiritual life. I just read it to you. From this day with God, page 211. If you're dead, maybe there's somebody here right now that is spiritually dead because you've been doing nothing but serving your own temporal interests, maybe for years. Would you like to come back to life spiritually? The Lord says, Awake, you that are asleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you life. What is this life given for? Read the first chapter of Desire of Ages if you want to find out. Everything that God has given life, He has given life to so that that thing or person or animal or plant can be of service to somebody or something else. That's even true of the inanimate things in the world. Read, read the first chapter of Desire of Ages. She goes over that in detail. She says, 
of everything that God has created. It is only the selfish heart of man that lives to itself. Everything else, the grass, the trees, the animal, the ocean, the rivers, the lake, the oxygen around us, everything in the world, everything ministers to something else or somebody else except the selfish heart of man. And remember what we read in Heaven's Ledger under the general heading of selfishness comes what? Every other sin. If I am sinning, it's because I'm selfish. If I am going to stop sinning, I'm going to have to stop being selfish. I'm going to have to start living for somebody else besides myself, my own temporal interests. And so then... She goes down and she says, How vividly then appeared their neglect, and how wise the arrangement of God in giving to every man a work to do to promote the cause and save his fellow men. Each was to demonstrate. Here's what we're to demonstrate. If you want to write it down, here's what we're to demonstrate. Number one, a living faith in his family. That's number one. By the way, the people that you live with in your home, they know whether you're a Christian or not. You might fool everybody else in the world, but you can't fool your wife and your husband. You can't fool, you can't fool your parents. They know your parents. They live, in the, they live in the same house with you. They know whether you're a Christian or not. Number one, each was to demonstrate a living faith in his family and in his neighborhood. That's number two. Do your neighbors know that you're a Christian? Now, how can, how can we demonstrate this living faith in our family and our neighborhood? There's some specific things that we can do. I'm going to read them. Number one. By showing kindness to the poor. Don't raise your hand. Is there anybody in this room that doesn't know of any poor people? That you, you're not personally acquainted with any poor people, or are you? Now, it's a common thing if you're in the upper middle class or above. I was reading yesterday on the internet. They had this article about the rich and how much money they're making and how there's the, the top one-tenth of one percent of the wealthy people in this country. Their income is in the neighborhood, I think they said 24 million a year. That's pretty big. And the richer people become, the more there's, a, if they've never been poor in their childhood, if they were poor as a children, this may be different, but if they've never been poor in their ch childhood, it's very easy for a rich person to look at a poor person and say, well, it's their own fault. Have you ever heard a, a person that's well-to-do look at somebody that was poor and say, well, it's their own fault? You ever seen that? I've seen, I've heard that so many times. I don't have any, need to have any notes to tell you. I've just heard, I know it. I've heard that so many times. It's their own fault. It's their fault. You know what? Jesus could have looked at us poor sinners and he could have said, it's your own fault. We'd been lost. And do you know that many of the people that Jesus healed, Ellen White says, their own sins had brought them into that sick condition. It was their own fault that they were sick. Many times. Not always. But even though it was their own fault, have you, have you ever been at fault and you knew you were at fault and you knew it was your fault and what did you want? Did you want a little bit of mercy? And Jesus healed the people even when it was their own fault that they were sick. So if one of the first things that we can do in our neighborhood, we need to look around. 
and say, am I showing kindness to the poor? That's a, num that's a number one. Now, if you read Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, you will see that how we deal with the people that are in difficult circumstances, whether it's being poor, sick, in prison, lack of food, lack of clothing, whatever it is, how we deal with those people, that's going to be the way that the Lord's going to make the decision, whether we're going to be on the right hand or on the left hand. You, you know what the story is about the sheep and the goats, and they're, on, they're divided up. And, it, and what makes the difference? It's how we treat people that are in trouble, even if it's their own fault. We need to pray for each other that when we see people in difficult situations, that instead of blaming them, what if it is their own fault? Do they still need help? When, when you got yourself into a difficult situation and it was your fault, did you still need help? Yes, still needed help. Still need mercy and you still need help. That's the first thing we can do is, am I showing kindness to the poor? You remember Daniel talked to the king about this. Look in Daniel, the fourth chapter. And this is the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And it says... Daniel 4, this is Daniel talking to the king about his dream. And then it says, Daniel's telling the, the king how the, what the judgment that's going to happen to him. And after Daniel finishes, that starts in verse 19. After Daniel finishes telling the king what's going to happen to him, he says in verse 27, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you and break off your sins by righteousness and your iniquities by doing what? By showing mercy to the poor. Maybe it'll lengthen your time of peace. Show mercy to the poor. Remember, mercy is something that the person receiving it doesn't deserve. If they deserve it, it's not mercy. If you're giving them what they deserve, that's just justice. But mercy is giving somebody something that they don't really deserve, and they can't claim that, they, that you owe it to them, but you're going to give it to them anyway. You're going to show mercy. That's the first thing. Each was to demonstrate a living faith in his family and in his neighborhood by showing kindness to the poor, sympathizing with the afflicted, that's the second thing. Is there anybody in this room that doesn't know somebody that's afflicted? I just mentioned at the first. We have a member of this church that's been in intensive care now for months. Never seen a situation like this before. We know people that are, by the way, when that happens, does that affect all that person's family? It's not just the victim of something that's affected. It's all of their family. Sympathizing with the afflicted. Now, you know what sympathize, the sympathy is. Sympathy means that you enter into the feeling of somebody else, whether it's gladness or sadness or whatever it is. Sympathy means you enter into the other person's feelings. This is what Jesus did. That's why Jesus entered into other people's feelings so much that it says that when he was on his way to Lazarus' tomb, it says in John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Didn't he know that just in a few minutes he was going to call him back to life and they were going to have such great rejoicing they wouldn't contain them? He knew all about that. But Ellen White says, in his mind, he experienced the feeling of the, of the human family 
and every funeral that there had ever been or ever would be in this world, he understood that and he understood how it felt. So it says he wept. Friends, if we're going to be ready for Jesus to come, we're going to have to learn how to sympathize with the afflicted. Not just say, well, let them go. It's their own fault. They go, oh. Remember, if the Lord had done that with us, we would all be lost. That's the second thing. A third thing is engaging in missionary labor. Showing kindness to the poor, sympathizing with the afflicted. Remember, when you're talking about sympathy and showing kindness, it's not whether or not it's their fault. That, that's not it. I used to be involved in a, a jail ministry, interdenominational jail ministry. And you know, when you visit somebody in prison, you're not there because you think that they don't need to be there. They may need to be there. I have visited in people in prison that I would not want them to be let out. because of how dangerous they were. But I could still sympathize with them because they were in trouble. That's what Jesus did for us. When we were in trouble and it was our own fault, He had enough sympathy for us. He said, I'm going to do something about it, no matter how much it costs. So He came down here. He left heaven. He left the throne of glory and He came down here. Just like we also are to leave our homes and not just be comfortable all the time. We are to go to where people need help. That's engaging in missionary labor. We need to go where people need help. The last thing she mentions is by aiding the cause of God with His means. Friend, do you want the Holy Spirit to bring you back to life? If you would like the Holy Spirit to recreate in you life, spiritual life, if you'd like to come back to life, if you're almost dead or if you are dead, the Lord would like to bring you back to life. But if that's going to happen, you're going to have to start living for other people and get active in doing something for somebody else and just not just yourself. It'll never happen. We're to have a living faith in our family, in our neighborhood. We're to show mercy to the poor. We're to sympathize with the afflicted. We're to engage in missionary labor, and we're to aid the cause of God with, with our means that He gives to us. Oh, friend, don't let the sin of mirage come on you in the day of judgment. Let's pray before I sing our closing song. Mm -hmm. Father in heaven, we pray that we may not be like the church in Sardis, that we may not be dead or almost dead, Lord, we want to be brought back to life. We want to have that vigorous spiritual life that Jesus had, and that vital power that He had so that You can use us to touch others that are in trouble. Lord, we pray that Your Holy Spirit will open our eyes to our true condition and what You want to do for us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number? He calls them all by name. By the greatness of His might and the strength of His power, not one is missing. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth.